there are three goals of ours Digital University, and we'd like to succeed in all three. The first one, it's sort of pointless for me to tell you what the goal is, because you're already doing it. The first goal is for you all to learn computer science and to help each other and work together and show that this way of learning computer science is effective. So that's kind of important. So I was going to say that you know, this is unlike most colleges you've been to and unlike MIT in the respect that it's not about doing a, taking a problem set home and doing it. It's more about uh, sitting with your friends and getting through this material together. So I guess from what I've seen <clears throat> in between traveling, I just came back from around the world trip for three weeks and then I got sick again. So, but such as I've been able to see, it looks like that's really working well. So we're achieving the first goal. Um, the second goal is to have external visibility. We have to let the rest of the world see what happens here. See the interesting people here, see the interesting lectures, look at the interesting course material, um, get to know some of you guys as best as they can virtually. Because only if we do that are we going to be able to get the funding in the long run to sustain this university. People have to see that it's working. It's not enough for it just to work. We have to tell everybody that we know. We have to show from the website. It's got to be apparent from the website what happens in this building and what's going on. So that's the second goal. And the third goal, which is dependent to some extent on the second one, is to inspire other people and other organizations to start up schools like this. So it'd be nice if we had another Ars Digital University campus <coughs> someday, say in Palo Alto, but much more interesting is if there's 100 schools that are like this, all of them uh, with different names and with different funding sources, but fundamentally being seeded with our curriculum, which is important to have it online and uh, to have the licensing status of all the content clear so that other schools can uh, use our stuff with a good conscience and see that it's usable. Um, but more importantly, probably the methods. So pretty soon we really need um, to have on the web a guide that says how to start a one-year post-baccalaureate computer science program that says, you know, here's how you advertise for students. Here's how you screen students. Here's how you uh, advertise for <clears throat> and hire instructors. Um, here's how you set up the facility. Uh, obviously, you have to hang some pictures. <laughs> Got off to a late start here, I hope. Nobody here is offended by any of the new artwork. <laughs> I guess we could reshuffle it. Um, I don't think I have an account. So somebody has to log in here. <clears throat> Has this computer ever been used? <laughs> that can't possibly work. <laughs> Anybody have a laptop? <laughs> do we have wire? We have what? Do we have wireless in this building? Waveland. <laughs> Except the, they, no, it's, it's not the same login. login. It's, it's a standard. I think Mike Allen has the. Yeah, where's the end line? Mike Allen's attempt to do something to your cell phone. Are you just going to be using Netscape? That was my hope. So let me. All right, well, I don't have too much else to say, <laughs> unfortunately. <clears throat> um, who has questions? <laughs> I'm supposed to be talking about engineering professionalism, but my presentation's online and I don't have it printed out. <clears throat> Who's funding ADU right now? Um, ours Digital Corporation has been funding it. Um, we have Barbara Link, who's a professional fundraiser par excellence. So she's been out beating the bushes. Um, so far without much success, but that could be because I think we haven't achieved goal number two of having a potential funder come to the website, see that there actually are people here. Like, I don't think there's a single picture on the website, or maybe it's hard to find, of the um, room over there. Am I right or am I wrong? Yeah. 
So would you give your money to some people that had demonstrated the ability to put up a text web page saying that they had a university? I mean, MIT and Harvard, <clears throat> nobody doubts that they exist. But actually, if I'm in California and I just made a lot of money in some uh, you know, uh, venture capital funded company, um, and you approach me for money, well, I might say, I don't even believe this place exists. I don't believe you have any students, and I, there's no way for me to tell. So you really need you know, the path from going to aduni.org into seeing people working, uh, what's been done, uh, is really critical. What's the corporation's interest in funding the university? Well, we didn't have, the uh, question is, what's the corporation's interest in funding the university? Um, fundamentally, um, it uh, got serves two functions, one of which we'll f learn about more today. Well, one is to provide a little bit more meaningful existence for the employees, so to have some reason to come to work and something that differentiates ours digital from other companies, so to be involved in education. Um, so that's one reason why ours digital foundation exists in the university. The second reason, and the one that you know is comprehensible by the executive level and the venture capital types is uh, marketing. So, you know, people will remember that, oh yeah, ours digita, well, if somebody says to you scient, viant, and sapient, unless you really are an expert on IT services, you probably won't have any idea what these three companies are and what's different among them. Um, similarly, broad vision vignette, only really specialized people, ATG, have any idea what products these companies make. So there's something that's nice about um, you know, people being able to say, oh, ours Digita, that's the company with its own university. So especially if the company's revenues were to keep growing, um, you know, this would become a smaller and smaller percentage of the overall revenue, and it'd be bearable expense. Unfortunately, now that we have venture capital and professional management, the <laughs> revenue curve seems to have been adjusted <coughs> to uh, something more conventional. Go figure. Hire conventional managers, and you end up with a conventional growth curve. <laughs> it didn't occur to me at the time. <laughs> Who else has questions? Might as well ask. You mentioned uh, the exposure of this as a functional university to the world as something like helpful for fundraising. Kind of respectful <laughs> action that we can take as students mm. or beneficiaries mm. of the university to help out with that? Well, probably. I mean, um, you'll be in a better position to help out with making the web presence bigger by uh, the time you finished uh, software engineering for web apps. <laughs> so, you know, the goal is not to. But yeah, I think everybody has to be. I mean, the, the, ours digital success was built on every programmer doing sales and marketing. So every time we hired a programmer, that person was responsible for writing up his or her results and publishing them to the world so that our marketing presence expanded as the programming staff expanded. And actually, so we hired some professional sales and marketing people, and the first thing that did was uh, stop the expansion of our sales and marketing presence, which makes sense because <clears throat> you hire these people, they're brand new, they're not doing very much, they don't really understand very much. Um, but meanwhile, everyone else in the company says, hey, there's professional sales and marketing people, so now it's not my job anymore. I don't have to worry about this. I can you know, go home at 5.30 and watch TV instead of writing up what I just did on this last project because now there's a professional uh, writer or, or marketing person who's going to write it up. But of course, um, so you know, maybe after a year or two, building a professional sales and marketing organization will increase your presence. So I think you know, you're seeing the same thing here. There's a few staff at Ars Digita Foundation but they're pretty new. Uh, it's not clear how much they can produce. And actually, it'd be much more effective if everybody here thought, well, can I write an article for a newspaper about my life here? Right? Well, actually, that punk kid, Aaron, <laughs> right? he's 13 years old. And he's done more for Ars Digita U, probably, than uh, you know, any of us this month. Um, because he, you know, he came here and visited, and he wrote about his experience, and he published it on the public internet. So if you go to Google and you search for Ars Digital University, in addition to our website, which could be a total fraud, you know, you'll find his article and uh, 
that'll give you the impression that it's a real place. So, <laughs> <coughs> is that it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> More questions? Um, just a quick observation on that, which is we've seen kind of several people come through, and um, presumably some of them potential donors and some of them aren't, and kind of think that we are probably the best advert. Because some of it, what we lack in hardcore computer skills, we make up from presentational <laughs> skills. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I could talk, I could talk the iron lens off a donkey as to why this is a good idea. And then we see these people going around, and then they go out again, and they don't talk to us. Yeah, well, of course, but the problem is that, you know, once they're in the building, the battle has been more or less run. I mean, my friend Cliantes has yeah. elaborate theories about dating. He necessarily takes a theoretical approach because he's <laughs> got a PhD in physics. Um, but, you know, he's got all this uh, sort of flux. Well, it's not really about how good your personality is. You don't have to work on that. You can just increase the amount of flux. So, you know, if you get out of your office and you just meet a lot of people, you know, eventually... Uh, he thinks that some woman will find him appealing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So it's the same th same deal here. I think there is. We have to give people reasons to come visit the site, and once they visit, All right. So my presentation's on the web. This is the ancient Wimpy Point server, not the latest ACS-backed Wimpy software. All right. I actually gave this to my students. <clears throat> so let's talk about engineering professionalism. There was a fellow named Barnes Wallace who was 53 years old at the time uh, in, I guess, 1939 when World War II was beginning to break out. And he worked as an aircraft designer for Vickers, a British company. His experience was in bombers and dirigibles. He actually worked a lot on um, these uh, dirigibles. And he was credited with a lot of work on the Wellington bomber, which was one of their big ones. <clears throat> okay, so he basically started with a clean sheet of paper. He just said, what can I do to shorten the war? And... You know, he wanted to use his skills, so one answer would be, well, pick up a rifle, go over to France, and try shooting some Germans. Um, but he said, well, you know, that's not really my main skill. As I'm pretty old compared to some of these young people, maybe not as fast or not as accurate with a rifle. So he thought, you know, I know a lot about bombs and bombers, and let me bump up the font size here. Um, I know a lot about bombs and bombers. The uh, RAF method of bombing was that their bombs were very small, and because their bombs were small, um, to do any damage to a machine within a factory, it would have to explode pretty much right on top of that machine. So even if you bombed a factory uh, with one bomb, it could be up and running the next day because you'd actually only damage the machines that were right next to the bombs. So the bombs themselves were quite old, and they dated from 1919. The planes were designed for these 500-pound bombs, and basically the idea was you drop as many as possible in the hopes that probabilistically you'll hit something important directly. Um, so Barnes said, look, this is never going to work. There were all these people who said, with bombing we can win the war, and he said it's never going to work to bomb Germany to win the war because the facilities and the transport that you need to bomb are scattered all over Germany and they're very hard to damage enough. So he said, what about getting at the sources of power? Any kind of factory needs power. Um, where does the power come from? And he looked at coal mines, oil wells, and hydroelectric plants. Um, I believe that he had to get rid of the idea of attacking coal mines because they tended to be underground. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and even if you attack the elevator successfully, it could be repaired easily. The Romanian oil fields were out of reach of the bombers that they had at the time. Um, there was a potential of some refineries in Germany. Uh, the dams were interesting. They had a bunch of hydroelectric dams that were big, and it took eight tons of water to make a ton of steel um, by the time you uh, 
generate electricity out of it. So we thought, okay, what about these dams? Um, the, uh, the dams were considered to a large extent impregnable. There are a hundred and Here's this Mona Dam. It's 110 feet thick at the base, about 25 feet thick at the top. It's made out of earth with a concrete face. It's 130 feet high total, so it's a pretty big um, block of earth. So it's not clear how you attack that. The Ader and the Zorpa were even bigger. Um, they had hundreds of millions of tons of water behind the dam, but even if you just, even if you got a thousand-pound bomb, which was the largest they were contemplating at the time, right on dispersed. You might chip the concrete, but that would be about it. Um, Wallace, <clears throat> one of the important things about being an engineer is to be widely read, not to be too narrow. So he had picked up some engineering journal, <clears throat> and he found, uh, he remembered back from 1935, he'd been reading this journal, and it was about the explosion of concrete piles that were being driven into the Thames River mud for Waterloo Bridge. So basically, there was a concrete pile and mud underneath, and they would have this big hammer that would come and drop down onto the concrete pile. That sent a shock wave into the mud, and the mud, I guess, was not very uh, compressible. So the shock wave would reflect back up into the concrete, and sometimes, if the concrete hammer was still on the pile, it would do okay. But if the concrete drop hammer had, if the drop hammer had lifted off of the piling, the shock wave coming back up had nowhere to go and it would stretch the concrete. So it turns out that concrete will withstand an infinite amount of compression, as you see from this building that's probably being held up by concrete. But if you put it in tension, it would just fly apart. So these pilings were appearing to explode uh, immediately after being hit. So <clears throat> the thing that he had in the back of the mi his mind was that concrete will withstand compression, but not tension. So I thought, okay, if you drop a bomb on the front of the dam, that's going to put the concrete into a bit of compression for an instant. How do we get tension going on? <clears throat> so the other thing that he thought about was that shock propagates really well in soil. That if you get a charge deep enough, the charge won't escape to the surface, but it'll do something called camoufletting, which is to propagate just in the soil. And he remembered from uh, World War I that a landmine exploded underneath this German-held hill, uh, destroyed the hill, and it generated a shockwave that was felt 300 miles away. So he designed a 10-ton bomb, which would contain seven pounds, seven tons of explosives, plus an aerodynamic casing. So he said, hey, I'll just fly this bomb up at 40,000 feet, drop it down. It'll hit the ground going almost 1,000 miles per hour burrow into 135 feet underground and generate this huge earthquake. What do you mean by aerodynamic casing? Uh, just like a pin or something, you know, something that would make it fall straight down fast. So um, they figured if the seven ton charge got uh, at least 130 feet down, that uh, it wouldn't break the surface, so the, the, the shock wave would go out sideways. So he designed that system, and he thought that that might be able to blow out some of the dams, just dropping one of these earthquake bombs nearby. Um, he actually designed a 50-ton bomber to carry the 10-ton bomb, and he actually uh, spammed out his idea to all these people involved in aircraft production, found that people would not reallocate resources from other projects, that they said, no, your idea is okay, it sounds a little kooky though, in any case, we're busy with our other stuff. Um, the latest and greatest bomber that was on the drawing board was only big and powerful enough to carry the new bomb to 20,000 feet, which wouldn't be high enough to get uh, the bomb deep, deeper than 130 feet. Um, and there was also, he was fighting tradition and experience, where people had this received wisdom that the way to win in a bombing campaign was to have lots of small bombs. So basically everybody said he was crazy, and he <clears throat> went back and back home, and he wrote a book-length document on the subject. So he actually went had to write a whole book explaining his idea from start to finish, and he sent it to the 70 politicians, scientists, and soldiers, um, which resulted, of course, in a committee being formed, <laughs> the Air Attack on Dams Committee. 
<clears throat> so the committee gave him the authority to go into a British research lab and build a model dam about 30 feet long, three feet in length, uh, three feet high, and uh, two feet thick. So what he would do is he would get explosives. He thought, well, what if I drop the explosives into the water behind the dam? That'll generate um, a shock wave going out in the water. It'll encounter the concrete, keep propagating, and then it'll encounter the air. So because it won't reflect back and there'll be nowhere for the energy to go, it'll get dissipated by the concrete being stretched. And maybe that'll blow a hole in the dam. So he found that. <clears throat> Four feet away, which was simulating a 200 foot away bomb on the real dam, that uh, there was no damage. Moving, it to t moving the charge to two feet away um, didn't uh, result in more than minor damage. And they really had to get um, a 50, 50 feet from the dam with a 14 ton bomb, which would have resulted in a 30 ton package, much too big for any bomber. So he was really despairing about this whole idea. He said, look, it doesn't look like it's going to work. We can't drop the bombs accurately enough. They have to be very, very close to the edge of the dam in order to work. And in any case, we need an amount of explosive that's too big and it's just impractical. And I will tell you as an aside that at the end of the war, um, they finally did develop his 10 ton bomb idea. And it worked just as predicted. They had near misses from the bomb, which were extremely effective. Um, they had a whole bunch of targets like brid bridges that they've been trying to blow up for years and years, and uh, with smaller bombs. And the earthquake bomb took them right out, even without a direct hit. They had a U-boat pen that was the world's largest concrete structure. It had required 7,000 slaves to build. It had a 23-foot thick, 23 thick reinforced concrete roof. <coughs> and uh, that was destroyed by one of the earthquake bombs. And they also managed to destroy a battleship uh, by dropping one of the earthquake bombs in the water. Uh, they tried to destroy Hitler's Eagle's Nest house at the top of a mountain in Bavaria, but it was covered in snow and they couldn't find it. So his idea did work, but it wouldn't, wasn't going to work against the dam. He figured that out. How heavy was our atomic bomb? How heavy was our atomic bomb? I don't know. That's a good question. Anybody know? Probably only a few tons. What? Five tons. Five tons. Yeah, but that was dropped by a B-29, which was much, much bigger than the planes they had at this time. So this was, uh, I think, 1942 or so. So uh, Wallace went back home, and he actually set up a tub in his backyard and a little tiny explosive charge. And he came to the conclusion that if you had three tons of RDX, explosive right up against the, exactly against the wall of the dam, that uh, it would take the dam out, the completed bomb would only weigh about five tons, and it could be carried in a bomber that had just been introduced. So Wallace actually picked up the phone, and he went through the yellow pages or whatever they had, and he found a company that had a private dam in Radnorshire. It was about a fifth the size of the uh, Mona, and uh, he got permission from this company to let him blow up their dam, <laughs> or blow a hole in it anyway. I guess they could fix it. It was probably an earthen dam, so they contemplating fix it. So he actually managed to blow a uh, 15 by 12 foot hole in this private dam with a small amount of explosive. So the bureaucrats, but it just really shows you that you, know, you can't rely on your marketing department. If you're an engineer, you can't rely on your business people. Sometimes you just have to open the yellow pages and do it yourself. That hole, and a picture of the hole, presumably, got him the go-ahead from the bureaucrats. Not really enthusiasm, which didn't come until some, he agreed to meet some guy. Uh, there was a senior official, I think, in the RAF who wanted advice on his own project. And even though Barnes Wallace was obsessed, you know, just out of the goodness of, it, of his heart, he agreed to let this guy come over to his lab, and he talked to him about his idea for a couple hours. Uh, so he was a bit generous with his engineering advice, <clears throat> and I think that's a good, um, a good tip to remember for your engineering careers, because even if you're working on something and you're deep down in it, it's good to maintain your links to the rest of the community. Be generous with your engineering help, because this guy then said, hey, Barnes, what are you working on? And so uh, Wallace told him all about his damn 
explosion project and this super senior guy got really excited and became a champion for it within the British. Right, you have to have set the explosive exactly up the dam. It has to be exactly up against the dam. So he came out with this crazy idea, which he started prototyping in 1942. And the idea came from in December. So he said, well, what if we just skip, what if we skip a rock? You can skip a rock across the water. So he said, what if we fly the bomber low across the water and we drop this bomb and it'll skip across the water and then it'll smack up against the edge of the dam, roll down and explode. That was his idea. So fly low, <laughs> drop this uh, skipping bomb, roll down across the edge of the uh, dam and uh, explode. So he came up with that idea. Um, he actually built the thing. So he set out in this converted Wellington bomber. They took the bomb doors off and had this huge circular a spherical bomb right underneath the fuselage. And they were flying around England and all these anti-aircraft gunners freaked out because they'd never seen that silhouette before. So they got shot at by a bunch of people. <laughs> uh, they dropped the dummy bomb and it just sank. <laughs> so they took this five ton thing of steel out over the water, dropped it, and uh, it sank. <laughs> so go figure. So he had actually been making a movie while dropping this bomb to see how it would skip. And he went and went over the footage, and he remembered in the back of his mind that the bomb had looked a little bit funny. Maybe it had uh, hit the water, and he just remembered that it looked a bit funny. He thought maybe it was deforming. So it wasn't a sphere anymore. It was somehow hitting the water, deforming. Might have skipped a little tiny bit, but then it sank. So he thought, well, let's strengthen the bomb. So let's strengthen the casing, make it a little bit bigger. And uh, this time he uh, filmed it again. And he ended up with a very compelling film of this five-ton bomb skipping, skipping, skipping along the water. And he used that film to generate official uh, go-ahead which came in early February. That's pretty tight because May was going to be the best time to breach the dams. That's when they were full of the spring, spring water. Um, by mid-February, his bosses at Vickers told him to drop work on the project, and it hadn't been approved. And then in late February, the official go-ahead was renewed. So at this point, there's only, what, March and April, basically, to do the final engineering. Why would a spherical bomb not skip? Well, why would it skip? Why would a spherical bomb skip? Well, remember, it's, it's in an airplane going a few hundred miles an hour over the water, so it still has the... Uh, it's the same reason a rock will skip if you... But it's, the rock is flat. Um, I, he, did, he definitely got it to skip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a physicist. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you need a lot of velocity. And, um, all right, so rapid prototyping, too was that uh, he, get, he ended up with a seven-foot around bomb that uh, the new Lancasters had to be modified even to hold this bomb, the big ones. Um, he had to pull in aerial reconnaissance. He got a Mosquito fast aircraft to fly overhead and take pictures every day, showing whether extra anti-aircraft batteries had been installed to see whether or not <coughs> um, the Germans had found out about this project. There actually was a pastor in a church underneath one of the dams, and he was a fanatic about this uh, possibility. So he foresaw uh, all through the war that the British would come and blow these dams up and flood out his vi village. <clears throat> and he knew that they weren't being very heavily defended because it was considered impossible to blow them up with a regular bomb. So he was constantly writing all these officials asking for more uh, anti-aircraft support on the dams and uh, it's funny to see the letters. You can actually see some of the letters back and forth. Um, one of the funny things is the German officials, they had stopped signing their letters, you know, very truly yours or best regards or whatever. They signed all their letters, letters Heil Hitler. So there would be a letter and then the closing was Heil Hitler, comma, you know, Joe, <laughs> <laughs> Dieter, whatever. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Anyway, they had, because of this pastor's constant nagging, they actually had uh, a fair amount of anti-aircraft defense on some of these dams, even though they considered him a crank. Um, 
he got a pretty good bomber group assembled um, because there was this commander who'd worked with uh, Wallace for many, many years and said, I've known him for 25 years. He's a wonderful engineer. I've never known him to produce what he says he will. <laughs> Not to. Sorry. So that shows you the importance of building a personal, professional reputation. You know, a lot of times companies will flake out and um, organizations will flake out, but you really have to have a personal reputation for delivering what you say you're going to, no matter what else. Otherwise, it's hard to get new projects going. Uh, the wing commander was a guy who was only 25 years old. I told this to my students at MIT, most of you guys. Uh, are beyond that uh, <laughs> age. But just to uh, show him what life was like in the hard old days, he'd already put his life on the line with 173 raids over Germany. Um, and uh, at the age of 25, he actually had a Labrador retriever named Nigger. Not a very politically correct <laughs> thing these days. Uh, and he took the dog everywhere with him on training flights and around the air bases, not on the combat missions. Um, so <clears throat> the other person that they had to pull in is they had to pull in an expert on low flying. They basically were going to go in with just a single squadron, which is not big enough to defend itself against all the German anti-aircraft stuff. So basically this low flying guy said, um, you got to keep um, below the bombers, the main heavy bombers that were constantly bombing Germany. That will avoid the fighters. Then you got to get a little bit lower still to avoid the heavy flak a little lower than that to avoid the light flak. And at that sort of treetop height, your only real risk are these balloons. They had anti-aircraft balloons with wires that would snag airplanes. And he said, well, they really don't seem to have any of these balloons along the main roads or the railroads. So you just follow those and you'll be OK. So they were going to fly over England into France and just follow the roads going, I guess, 150 miles an hour or whatever. In the dark, I think they picked a moonless night. Um, and they, had, they, they needed larger scale maps because they were flying so low, so they kind of invented a new way of doing navigation with strip maps, sort of like triptychs. Um, so they had to develop all those um, problems, uh, solutions to the problems. Then the bombs were often off target. They were having a lot of trouble. Um, they were having a lot of trouble getting the horizontal distance from the front of the dam correct. So they were dropping them too early or too late. So that sometimes they would fly over the top of the dam or uh, they would sink into the water before hitting the edge. So they ended up building a plywood site that you would hold onto your nose if you were the pilot with two nails in it. And there were little towers on the tops of the dams. And each pilot, depending on the dam they were going to attack, got a custom made little wooden site. And basically, uh, as soon as the towers lined up with the nails, they were at the correct vertical, dis uh, correct horizontal distance from the front of the dam. So they solved that problem. Um, the other thing that, uh, yeah, with the sites, their average error was only four yards. So they were able to drop the bomb within four yards. Um, they were having trouble keeping a steady height over the lake. I believe they had to be 60 feet above the lake, and it's a moonless night. So sometimes they would get too low and suck water into the engines. Sometimes they would be too high, which uh, actually impeded the skipping. So if you were too high and you just dropped the bomb down, it would sink much faster. So what they did was they put um, spotlights on the front and the back of the airplane. They would shine down onto the water and converge when the plane was exactly 60 feet above the lake. So they solved that problem. And Wallace, remember, was intimately involved in all of these solutions. So he had to think of the breadth of stuff that he had to worry about. Uh, they were continuing to have problems with the bombs breaking up when hitting the water. They just weren't strong enough. Um, so um, they had to strengthen the casing. Once they strengthened the casing, the bomb was too big to fit underneath the uh, aircraft. They could have extended the landing gear or hollowed out the runway or something. Uh, but they had this huge bomb underneath the aircraft. And they were running short of time. So what they did was they turned the bombs into cylinders. So they had a very, very strong bomb that could be carried um, sideways underneath the airplane. And then they wouldn't need to have taller landing gear or whatever. 
So that worked okay, except the cylinders didn't skip. They would kind of tumble and they would snag the water and fall down. So what they did was they hung the cylinders down below the airplane, they put an electric motor on the supports, and they would spin the cylinders really fast uh, for a couple minutes before dropping them onto the water, and that gave the cylinders enough angular momentum to keep stability. Um, so April 29th, they finally got a bomb that could fit under the plane, that didn't break up on impact in the water, and that didn't sink. So it took about two months. As you see, they used up almost the whole two months. <clears throat> two weeks later, they finally found the right uh, weather, I guess, to do the attack. And there's a photo here on the web that I found. So here's the airplane with the cylindrical bomb underneath. And there's, I guess, you can sort of see the motor, maybe. Um, and here, I forget which dam this is. Uh, might be the Mona. Anyway, so there's obviously a pretty good size hole in it. So this had a big impact for one person. The Germans estimate that the lost industrial production was uh, several hundred thousand person months. So this one engineer was able to have a huge impact. 25 bridges were destroyed and 21 damaged. 125 factories were destroyed. Um, I like going to Germany actually these days because Eve, um, you know, being an aggressive vegetarian has me on a meat restricted diet. But in Germany you can have five me meat five times a day and nobody thinks um, that you're strange. So <laughs> I think they were probably very upset that 6,500 cows and pigs were killed. Uh, 1,294 people were killed unfortunately. And mostly they were slave laborers, actually, because I guess average Germans were, you know, at the front if they were guys or somewhere else. So the factories were mostly manned by slaves that had been pulled in from uh, Eastern Europe and so forth. Uh, the British lost eight out of 19 airplanes with 53 uh, people killed. So it was quite a dangerous mission. Uh, the commander actually died um, a year later, July 1944. Um, flying against a, a factory in the Ruhr. And Barnes Wallace, in 1950, was finally awarded 10,000 pounds by the uh, Royal Commission on Inventors, awards to inventors, and he donated all the money to a fund for the education of children of men who died in the uh, RAF. All right, so <clears throat> what do we learn from this example? We learned that you have to pick your problem uh, wisely. So it's much more important to do the right thing than to do the thing right. It's good to do the thing right, but I have a lot of friends who are MIT graduates, and generally MIT graduates can be relied upon to do the thing right. But there's been a tremendous differential in the amount of impact they've had because some of them were working on the right thing and others weren't. Hewlett Packard's a good example of a company that um, everything they do, they pretty much do right. There's no Hewlett Packard product that isn't really well engineered, but a lot of times they don't really work on the right thing. So Cisco has a higher market cap than HP, even though they haven't been around very long, even though they don't have as much revenue, because people think that, okay, the, the Cisco guys are going to work on the right thing, and uh, they probably won't do it, probably won't be engineered as well as an HP product. Um, but neither Hewlett nor Packard were MIT credits. Uh, that's not true. The observation is that neither Hewlett nor Packard were MIT grads. Uh, I believe that Hewlett, who was the more interesting one of the two and who did not work for Richard Nixon, um, <laughs> I believe that Hewlett got a master's degree at MIT. I but you're right. Stanford. 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 They were Stanford guys. Uh, yeah, they've given a whole lot of money to Stanford, but the computer science building, thanks to $20 million from Bill Gates, so $6 million, sorry. Six million dollars from Bill Gates uh, got them to rename the CS building the Gates building, even though H&P have really supported that whole school for years. <clears throat> All right, so pick your problem wisely. Um, learn to write. So Wallace did a lot of writing and convincing and controlling. He wrote book-length documents. He wrote long memos. The whole success of this project really depended upon his um, ability to communicate his ideas in writing, because that's the only way they can be really passed around, 
to a lot of people. He had to give his idea to hundreds and hundreds of people in writing before um, it finally took. He ended up having to learn to make movies. So uh, it turns out to be important to learn you know, audiovisual stuff if uh, you need to persuade people. He was obviously good at explaining and persuading. He was pretty patient. He got a financial reward on this project 11 years after it started. He got an accomplishment reward on this project only about, f well, I guess, about four years after it started. But definitely, um, you sometimes have to be pretty patient to wait for your ideas to come to uh, fruition. He was certainly creative, and he was very, very persistent. He had a lot of false starts, and there was, most people would have just given this up after proving to themselves that you know, it would require an enormous explosive so close to the dam that no bomber could ever get it that close and that accurate. And, uh, he just kept plugging away at it. I'm not sure that I want to keep going with this presentation. Did he fly out on, it, on the first mission? No, of course not. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, I'm going to just give you some ideas for software engineering professionalism in 2000. I think some of you guys, raise your hand if you haven't seen this article. Uh, most people haven't. OK, so I wrote this. Um, I don't know. The term professional keeps getting handed around. Uh, I think in the old days, and certainly with medical doctors, it means that you're good at your job. But in the software world, it seems to mean something else. So here we had this Oracle driver for AOL server, which you might learn about someday. It's not very interesting. It's just some C code uh, to bridge the web server to the database. <clears throat> and one of our customers actually wrote in um, saying that uh, the following highly unprofessional comment in the original source code, um, and then it's the C <laughs> comment here, how the fuck were we supposed to know it was a DML statement? Anyway, it is, so we retry with one iteration. Should public domain source have this kind of language in it? Is it a good reflection on RS Digita? So, um, <laughs> so I got that, and I thought, well, Look, Cotton Seed is the name of the guy who wrote the code. He's an MIT dropout, actually. Uh, his sister's name is Caraway Seed, <laughs> which I'll tell you, just, just tell your parents to say no to drugs anyway. <laughs> um, you know, should we call him unprofessional? Is that the right term for this because of his source code, which is never visible to an end user? Or does he get credit for having made an honest effort to build this software, release it to the public, um, and further credit for calling attention to this part of the code that probably could be improved? Um, so that's one example of how you know, the person who wrote me that thing saying Cotton was unprofessional for using a nasty word or a naughty word, um, he obviously had an idea in his mind of what it meant to be a good sof a, a software engineering professional. Here's another example. Here's the old Ars Digital website. I used to have this idea that, well, very few of the people who come, most websites for corporations are just sell, sell, sell. You know, if, if, you, if any of us go to visit, you know, the Siemens gas turbine division webpage, what you'll find there is essentially a brochure for a Siemens gas turbine. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I don't think I'm ever going to be in the market for a you know, 10 million kilowatt gas turbine. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and, and ours did it sort of the same. You know, we had this expensive product, service contracts and support contracts for enterprise software that could only be bought by a few thousand companies worldwide. If some random person comes to visit our webpage, why should we try to sell on this multi-million dollar service? Uh, why not say, Hey, segment yourself. If you're anybody, you might be interested in our birthday reminder service or scorecard to find out if your neighborhood's polluted. If you're a kid, this was before the university, you know, come to the Ars Digita Foundation because we have this $10,000 prize. If you're a nerd, you can download our open source software. If you're a poor web publisher, we have some free services. If you're a rich web publisher, um, challenge us with your innovative, you know, and that's the link to the sales pitch. So that's what I had, and I thought this was actually a good idea because you let the users segment themselves out. It becomes a user-oriented site 
where people get the information that's most relevant to them. So this MIT computer science senior, he says, um, you can't say rich and poor when what you mean to say is rich and poor. <laughs> I said, well, why not? He said, it's unprofessional. <clears throat> so I worked with this kid for a while, talked to him, and I found out that his definition of professional was the same that a Mary Kay cosmetic saleswoman would have. Professional to him meant you drive a nice clean car, you have neat clothing, and your language doesn't offend anybody. And I thought, well, that's sort of strange because in medicine, you know, if somebody says, hey, this surgeon is a great professional, um, I don't expect to never be offended by anything that surgeon says. I don't expect the surgeon to be really well dressed. I don't, uh, I guess, I guess surgeons have money, so I might expect, you know, uh, there, there to be a nice car somewhere in there, but I'm not sure if I expect it to be clean. Just in terms of being able to practice as a software engineer, what does that mean? It means your code is getting into actual use. Um, so it's awfully tough for people to uh, do that by themselves. It would be tough for, in 1985 for the software engineer to teach other programmers um, because the software is closed source and the organization's employment agreements uh, mandate secrecy. So in 1985, very hard to do any of the things that surgeon number three was doing. Innovating, practicing at the state of the art, and teaching. Those were things that would be tough to do. Um, because basically, if you were a programmer in 1985, you were a factory employee, pure and simple. You could aspire to craftsmanship, but not professionalism. So one thing you could do is you guys might say, well, hey, you could go to the university. If you, if you left in 1985 and went to the university, um, the university would let you innovate, tell people about your innovation, and teach people. But the thing that you couldn't do at the university in 1985 was practice at the state of the art because nobody was going to give you funding for 50 people and it needs 50, and usually required 50 people to get a software product out the door and into people's hands. So I think it's changed. In the year 2000, um, there are still people who have the old idea of software engineering professionalism as the richer and blander you are, the more professional you are. So my friends in Silicon Valley, they worship John Doerr, who's a rich venture capitalist. I don't think he's ever innovated or taught anybody anything, but he certainly is rich and he's pretty bland. <laughs> um, but I think there's evidence that despite this still prevalent attitude, the standards are shifting. Um, look at Richard Stallman and Linus Torvalds. These guys practice at the state of the art because they write computer programs that people actually use, like the GNU tools, the Linux kernel. Uh, they've innovated. Stallman you know, wrote one of the first multi-window environments. Uh, Torvalds came up with, um, which was Emacs, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> Torvalds came up with a um, new method of coordinating software developers worldwide. Uh, both of them have taught other people how to practice their innovation by writing, by releasing source code. Um, I believe that now with the internet, <clears throat> it's possible for an individual to practice at the state of the art. The internet makes it possible for one or two people to produce a piece of software get it distributed and used by people all over the world. Um, so it is now within a programmer's power to uh, improve his or her practice as a software engineering professional. Let's come up with a new definition, though. I don't like these old definitions because my clothes aren't so great and my speech isn't always inoffensive. So at least for purely selfish reasons, I'd rather have a different definition. <laughs> um, so can we pick these seven axes? I'm going to ho hoping I can convince you that these are uh, good ones. So the professional programmer picks a worthwhile problem to attack. Um, so what does that mean? What's worthwhile? Well, if you're a scientist, a worthwhile problem could be anything, or a mathematician, it could be anything that's beautiful. So it's worthwhile because, oh, look at this cool structure. Um, I'm studying category theory for the next five years just because I like it. Well, that's fine if you're a scientist or a mathematician, 
But if you're an engineer, and at least at MIT, computer science is part of the School of Engineering, you ought to build something that solves a real user problem. Um, the professional programmer has a dedication to the end user experience. You're not a mere tool of some marketing people or some UI specialist. You actually take ownership of what happens when a user sits down and uses your software. Um, the professional programmer does high quality work. This is kind of the old craftsmanship value from 1985. Um, so you have good system design, maintainability, documentation. Um, Axis 4 is innovation. So there's a bunch of jobs out there that really, believe it or not, aren't very innovative. You could get a job at, um, I don't know, uh, well, certainly there's porting jobs, right? You could certainly get a job at Microsoft and they would say, hey, take this latest version of Excel and make it run on the Mac. Somebody ought to do it, but I don't think that's, it's hard to be a great professional if all you're doing is taking something that already works on uh, one kind of system and porting it to another system. Or, for example, you could work for a company that says, hey, um, our competitor just released a product that does X, Y, and Z. Uh, would you mind building uh, a, a competitive system that does X, Y, and Z? Basically, if you spend your time doing that, you're implicitly saying that your information system is good enough and um, the users aren't entitled to anything better. But the reality is that information systems, by and large, aren't good enough. The users are entitled to something better. And if you want to be a professional, you ought to be producing something that's actually better, not just a copy of some crummy old system. Uh, teaching by example, so that means open source, um, if you want to be a professional. Teaching by documentation, it's comforting to think that you'll hire somebody to document your code. But the fact of the matter is that the readable and useful documentation has always been written by programmers, sometimes kept up to date and kept in sync by professional doc people. But fundamentally, only the programmer can know what's important about a system. Um, teaching face to face. So ours, Digital University, is part of that. Um, you know, you have to basically teach fellow workers and code reviews, teach short overview lectures to the public, uh, teach multi-week or, in this case, one-year courses. So how do we do it at Ars Digita? So this was a big factor in starting this company. Um, we commit to attacking the hard problems. That's how we help people um, achieve on Axis 1. So remember, Axis 1 is a worthwhile problem to attack. So instead of having a new programmer build the 10,000th feature of a little niche product, we say, oh, welcome to Ars Digita. Why don't you uh, build an accounting system so we don't have to use QuickBooks here anymore? And then, you know, open source that so other companies can have an open source accounting system. Um, a marketing person would say, hey, there's plenty of accounting systems out there. You know, you shouldn't uh, be building an accounting system. But actually, uh, you know, having uh, a new programmer work on some tiny little narrow feature, not very satisfying career. We st try to stay lean, uh, at least we used to, <laughs> on like sales, account management, user interface, and UI people, UI user experience people. Make the programming team responsible uh, for the user experience on the site and own it. <clears throat> you can only do high quality work if you have high quality people working with you. You've got to give little respect to the old code and not strive for compatibility with too many substrate systems. That's if you're going to innovate. Right? Remember we said number four is a professional programmer innovates? Well. Um, let's think about porting ACS to Microsoft SQL Server. So somebody might say, Phil, think of all the people out there who don't run Oracle. They only have 40% market share. If you ported to SQL Server, you could have your software used by 30% more people. Why don't you invest in that? Wouldn't be that hard. I say, well, I don't invest in that because I think ACS sucks doesn't do out of the box everything that I want it to do. I want somebody to be able to say, here's my company, here's my organization, I want this program to do my accounting, keep track of all my employees, uh, keep track of all the work that we've done, keep track of all the customer interactions that we've had, keep track of all the people who are supposed to be mentoring and teaching each other. And if it doesn't do that out of the box on top of Oracle, then it sucks. And why would I invest effort and time taking something that sucks 
and making it suck on top of SQL Server? <laughs> Wouldn't it be better to take the effort and turn it toward the uh, task of making ACS not suck? So strict open source software policy. Um, so that helps people teach by example. Um, help people teach by, to writing. We just drag them out to writing retreats and so forth and cajole them. Um, teaching face-to-face -face, uh, on Access 7, one of the ways that we help people is by hiring good folks. You guys haven't been exposed to the brutal reality of most companies, but if you go to an average company with, say, 100 programmers, you'll find four of them are pretty good. And those four people are the most inaccessible people in the company. They hide from everybody else because they know that the other people are so weak and so lazy and they'll never come up to an acceptable standard. And it's kind of like they're, they're like drowning swimmers, right? If you go and try to help them, they'll just pull you down. So um, the only way to have a culture of mentoring is to make sure that the people that are there who are junior are smart enough and energetic enough that you think, well, look, I'm going to invest an hour in working with this person today because I know that six months from now, he or she is going to be able to do my job. And so that's one thing that we've done at Ars Digita when you have these you know, 23-year-old um, MIT and UC Berkeley punks and stuff. You know, they're not always that great in terms of what they can accomplish, but as long as they're energetic and willing to learn, you generally, um, I don't feel that you know, my investment in working with them is going to be wasted. They're going to eventually become really top-notch engineers. Uh, so yeah, we established our own university as part of seven to let people teach face to face. <clears throat> so I wrote this in uh, April 2000, and I said, "How did it work?" And it turns out these Caltech guys were managing the release of ACS 3.2, and somebody pointed out that the index page contained a source code comment, ACS 3.2, and it was tagged the MIT sucks uh, release. So. That's what's happening. Um, all right, well, that's probably a pretty good stopping point for now. Maybe I should take a few questions. Can you say a bit more about the open source concept and in terms of how does it make sense from a business perspective? So how does open source make <clears throat> sense from a business perspective? That's a good question. Let's say you're building desktop software, like Red Hat Linux. Um, you know, this is something that people download, they install. Um, I think it's pretty tough to make money doing open source software that way in the sense that Microsoft made money with their kind of desktop software, just getting an annuity from every system that was sold. Um, I think it's easier in enterprise software like Ars Digita because enterprise software is something that's traditionally, there's some kind of payment every year between every company that runs, say, SAP and SAP. You could call it, I mean, SAP, they break it up into license, support, and service. But there's no real reason to break it up that way. I mean, they're generating a certain amount of value for the company. The company keeps wanting access to help and to new versions of the software. So basically, I think that you can, uh, you, you can soak them for a certain amount every year if your system is, in fact, generating real value for that organization. And they're not going to begrudge you the money. So enterprise software is one where it's fairly luxurious to be free and open source because in practice, the people that really rely on your software don't have much incentive to cheat. So for example, at Ars Digita, it's true, there's 10,000 downloads of ACS. Most of those people don't pay us anything. But you know, a dot-com in France, we don't have an office there. We can't really do much for them. They don't have much money to begin with. That's not a really interesting example of freeloading. Um, there's a few companies freeloading, like SAP Japan runs their um, SAP Japan runs their kind of customer service for all their servers and coordinates all their IT activity using our software, and they're not paying us. So you might say, "Well, that sucks." You know, if you had a license fee, you get all this money. Well, the fact of the matter is, if we had a license fee, we never would have gotten into SAP Japan because they have an entire purchasing department devoted to preventing them from buying software from vendors like ours, Digita. They'd say, oh, you know, a couple years old, three years old, a couple hundred people, they're too small. You're not, we're not going to let you rely on their software. Um, so I think it's actually 
So far at Ars Digita, it's completely helped us. It's gotten us into a lot of places we wouldn't be otherwise, <laughs> like SAP Japan that we can brag about. The companies that you know, we really help and do some work for, like Siemens, uh, they've been paying a pretty fair price. And you know, if we chopped it up in a different way, license fee, oftentimes it's just the size of the budget that you get, especially in the web. You know, sometimes people say, well, if we had a you know, million dollar license fee, like Broad Vision, we make another extra million dollars. But I look at a lot of our customers, they only had a $2 million budget for nerd stuff. And we took all of their money. I mean, once you take all of somebody's money, you can't get more. <laughs> As a business person, that's my theory anyway, that you can have marketing, you can have a license fee, but the only way to get more money is to have richer customers. So you know, if you did the same project for a richer customer, you probably could also bill more, but it would have nothing to do with whether or not you had a license fee and whether or not you're open source. So I think it's helped us. We just, you know, we haven't gotten some of the really delicious $10 million type contracts that Scient gets, but you know, that's because they have marketing and we don't, not because they have. Well, they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't have a license fee for their stuff, they're pure services. Has all the stuff that our digital done stayed open source, or are there components that people have paid for separately that they own? Um, there's weird things that are very customer specific that the customer owns. Um, generally, we've never had an issue with a customer that wanted to clutch onto something uh, that we wanted to open source. You know, like Scorecard, I don't even know the status of that software, but you know, it's so weird. I don't know if you've looked at the Scorecard.org site. It's an environment. You know, it's 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 not it's not really relevant who owns it because the only the only person in the world that would really want it is Environmental Defense. There was another question here. Gador? What? I'm just kind of curious. I read the other day, it's on your web page. They contract with the World Bank. Yeah. What, what happens with the World Bank? Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> it's, what, it's the only website we've built that's been protested against, <laughs> as far as I know. <clears throat> um, they want a sort of a knowledge management system for people worldwide. Uh, who are interested in the kind of things the World Bank's interested in, like development, poverty, water resources. So basically, there's little spaces on the site where people who are experts, like they're a mayor of a water short town, can guide other people in a similar area to other resources around the web. So it's, a, it's really more of, as you can see it, it's public at gateway.rsdigita.com. Um, they couldn't, they have so many people who work at the World Bank that they couldn't agree on a domain name. <laughs> so they're using our development server name, Gateway. They publicly launched gateway.rsdigital.com, which is, I think, insane. Um, <laughs> but anyway, they're doing it. And it's a pretty nice looking site. Um, so yeah, it's basically knowledge management and information sharing. You could also look at it a little bit like. I couldn't find it, but now I know why I couldn't find it. Yeah. <laughs> We only even started the project in late July, so it's pretty new. And we were working, charging hard for a demo to the World Bank something or other committee in Prague on September 23rd, I think. So it's sort of soft launch, I think, is the best way to look at it. But it's pretty complete. It looks, looks good. They have a lot of people working on content for it. It's not a real challenging problem, technically. Any more questions? People want to get to the food? All right, well, I'm going to hang out here, and we can